do this. Let's do this. Yeah, man, we're high tech here in Harvard Space. What are you talking about? This is Europe's modern university, right? Yes. <laughs> Cutting edge technology. <laughs> <laughs> so I should get to know you guys since we're, that we're waiting. So how about we just go around and talk? Sure. Yeah, you want to? My name is Valeri. I'm from Bulgaria, and I'm a full stack yeah. uh, web developer. Nice. What are you studying here? I'm studying computer science. OK, so under a uh, bachelor? Yeah, okay. first year. Cool. Nice. Nice to meet you. Valeri. Valeri. Which part of Bulgaria? Uh, have you heard of Sofia, the capital? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are live, look at this. Amazing. All right, hello world. Thanks for tuning in. If anybody's tuning in, probably nobody's tuning in. Um, and, and thanks everybody for, for joining. I know a, a bunch of people just got out of a class, maybe a long class, so I appreciate you coming to another uh, session, sitting, sitting here, and, and hopefully this will be worth your while. I'll try to uh, get to the interesting parts fastest. So, uh, quickly, my name is uh, Murtada. I'm a software engineer at Facebook, and originally I'm, I'm from Iraq. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story, taking you back to the beginning, but quickly I want to hear from you. Uh, I got to know some folks here while we were waiting. How many people here are studying uh, bachelor? Okay, most people are in bachelor. How many people are first year here? Like they just got here like two months ago, three months ago? Okay, that's a new batch. How many people are in masters? Okay. And how many people already had a job as a programmer or, or developer before? OK, so about a third. And today we'll be talking about uh, coding interviews and how to crush the coding interview. So uh, in, in, I've been at Facebook for nearly nine years. And I've done hundreds of interviews while there. Most of them have been coding interviews. 
And you know, to get a job at a company like Facebook, you gotta get through the coding interview. So we'll be talking about this uh, uh, a lot of a lot of today's session. But quickly before I I, I get into the, the the workshop, I'll tell you a little bit more about my journey and how I got to uh, to where I am today, or to get to you know be a software engineer. So I'll take you back a very very long time ago. Does anybody recognize this? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, so this is an Atari. I don't know how old people here are, so some of you may not have been born when this thing uh, came out. This, was, this, this device probably, at least in my country, in Iraq, was popular in like 1999. And, you know, everybody was getting one. It was a game console. It's like the PlayStation of, you know, 23 years ago. And everybody was getting one in, in, um, in my city. And, you know, my cousins, my, our friends were getting one. And you know, you play on this, you play video games. One of the video games is Mario. Probably most people know Mario. And we, uh, we wanted to get an Atari and play video games, but my dad was really against it. He was like, no, video games are bad for you. They make you stupid. You waste your time. You better study and, and get good grades. And so he was against it. But we were kids. We were nagging for a long time. And eventually, he caved in. He was like, fine, I'm going to go get one. So he went to buy us an Atari. And he came home. And we were all excited. You know, we're finally going to get a game console. And then he brought this thing. And, and I don't, does anybody recognize this thing? So this, 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 the writing here is in Arabic, actually. So this, this is like how computers used to look like back in 99. Um, it's, it's, called, it's a local Iraqi-made uh, version of a computer that runs like MS-DOS and runs, you know, the, the, the programming language on it is Quick Basic. I don't know if any of these terms make sense to, to folks here, because now we talk about React and JavaScript and uh, front-end development, back-end development. Back then, none of these things existed. So, so, so it's not it's not a typewriter. Yeah. So, so it it actually looks like it. It looks like a keyboard, right? But it's a complete computer. So this is how computers looked like back then. You plug it into the TV, and and you put you put cartridges here. So you see these two slots. You put a cartridge, and that's basically going to be your operating system or your program, and you know, I don't, I don't even remember what the, like the capacity or the memory of this thing was or how much storage that cartridge had on it. Probably a, a few kilobytes or a megabyte at, at most. And so this is, this is, you know, he brought us this thing. And we're kids. Like, I was probably five or six years old at the time. And he was like, yeah, you know, I didn't bring you a game console to play games on it. I brought you something better on it. Brought you this thing. You can, instead of playing games, you can make games with it. And we're like, uh... We don't care about making games. We're kids. We want to play games. And so, you know, we had nothing better to do at the time. We, so in, like, the summer holiday of wh whatever year that was, we just, like, sat around and learned on it and started learning some basic for loops and if statements. You know, my dad brought a manual with it, too. So we were just learning, the, like, the very basics of coding or, like, the basics of computers. And nobody had a computer at the time. This thing was, uh, like, a, a weird machine. And you know, time computers evolved, and a few years later, they now you know had the Pentium. I don't know if anybody recognizes the name of a Pentium. It's like the Intel processor that uh, was in, inside computers, and now computers have like a tower or a desktop, and like you know, you have like multiple components in it. So a few years later, this is here. I'm 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 here, nine years old, sitting in front of a Pentium three, and I was actually using this to teach people how to use like Microsoft Office and, and Windows. This is um, back in 2002, I think. And you know, people were starting to need to use computers for their jobs. So I was giving workshops to, to people. So now here, I'm giving you a workshop. And I've had some experience since, since I've been nine years old. So hopefully, this does not suck since I've been doing it for a while. And, and you know, the, the folks that came, they were people who were like 30, 40 years old who had a job and needed to learn how to use a computer for their work. So, it was a very interesting uh, setup that I'm like this little kid teaching these folks. And like they always like thought, because they were paying for this. They, I worked at a shop, and they paid the shop owner. I was just doing this for free. And the shop owner would just have them come and like learn with me. And they're like, who is this kid, and why is he teaching me? And then he's like, no, trust me, you'll, you'll see. He, he can teach you. And then he says, if you don't learn anything, you'll get your money back. And I don't think anybody got their money back. Um, so anyways, that's back then. A few years later, well, many years later, I went to a college in, in Canada, University of British Columbia. Is anybody from Canada or the US here? No? OK. 
Um, so I went to university in Canada on the West Coast in a city called Vancouver. Um, and that's where I studied computer engineering. And one of the things, one of the moments in my uh, career in university was in second year, I was taking a course on data structures and algorithms. And you know, this is like one of the most important uh, topics of learning the principles of computer science and computer engineering. And we had a student in the class, you know, he was typing the code that his professor was writing. The professor was writing and like he was just copying it into his computer and he was hitting execute. The, the course was taught in C++, so he was trying to run the code and it didn't work. And the professor said, and the, the student said, hey, it's, it's, not, it's not compiling this code. And, and the professor, and he said this, he said, he said, I'm a computer science professor. The last time I wrote code that compiled was 15 years ago. I don't know why your code isn't compiling. So, so that was like, like, holy crap, like this guy is teaching us coding and he has not written code that compiles in 15 years. So like, <laughs> we're screwed. So, so that was a moment when I, I started to realize um, I needed to do something different than, than uh, you know, just sit in class and, and learn uh, coding from lectures and you know, PowerPoint presentations which is ironic because here now I have a PowerPoint presentation to talk to you about it. Um, but, you know, so I started applying for jobs in, in second year university. I started applying to internships. I applied to more than 50 positions. I was not getting anything. Um, I even wouldn't get an interview. And the few interviews I got after so many applications, I would get rejected. And even though they asked me all kinds of questions that I had no idea how to answer them. And so that's when I started to figure out what the, the kind of problems or, or interviews that, uh, or the kind of topics in, in, that are in interviews. At the time, you know, this is back in 2000, 2010. So the internet was not as resourceful. Like now we have all these websites that tell you so many things. Back at that time, this is, you know, 11 years ago, there was less things on the internet. Or maybe I was just not as good as finding them out. So, so I, you know, it took me a while to figure this out. Then I started solving these interview problems or these programming questions that nowadays you get them on you know, HackerRank or, or LeetCode or, or Caddis. There are other ones like, what is it called, Code Forces? And then you, know, you guys are working on leagues of code. I don't know if it's doing the same thing. But there are so many platforms nowadays that offer you practice problems uh, for most of them will look like interview problems that companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, and so on would ask. So I did more than 100 of these problems. And I had a few internships. Eventually, um, I, I applied to Facebook, which to me was like a wild thing to even think about applying to. It was a company that I felt was just out of my reach, I, like I could never work there. I, I'm just this kid who comes from Iraq, and you know, at best I came here to this university, and this is probably the best that I would ever be able to do. So I always um, avoided applying to big companies because I thought I would not get in. But then, you know, one day I was feeling crazy and thought, hey, let me just give it a try and submitted an application to Facebook and um, I got the offer and when I signed the offer I received this, um, this uh, poster in the, in the mail. They sent me like this package with a Facebook t-shirt and this poster and it says, uh, fortune favors the bold. And this poster has been something that I treasure and, and hold dear. Uh, it's it's a, one of the values that Facebook, well actually now I, I'm saying Facebook but now it's called Meta. I have not been used to the name, so forgive me. It's, Facebook is not a company that exists anymore. Um, so at Meta, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the values that I found to uh, be, be something that's so encouraged and, and so ingrained in the culture, like being bold and taking bold decisions. And it's something that I try to live and, and uphold in my life, in, in my personal life, in my projects, in my adventures. It's this act of boldness or this, this attitude of boldness towards um, the decisions I make, the choices I, I, I make. So I'm sharing this with you because I think in, in a lot of the things we, we do in life, uh, we are indeed more likely to stumble upon fortune if we are bold. And, and this saying has always uh, been, been true in, in, in the experiences I've had. And I think I wouldn't be standing here today if not for so many decisions I've taken in life that, that involved being uh, taking risks or being bold. And so, you know, just something for you to think about. That was kind of my introductory spiel. Now we can talk about the, the workshop or the, the content of, of today's session, which is 
crushing your, your coding interview and, and, and how, to do, um, how to do well in the interview. OK, any, any questions so far? I know I just kind of talked about myself, and that's not very interesting. But um, any, any questions or anything? Right now, I'm 29. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I joined Facebook the first time when I, I was 19. That was when, when I did an internship there. And that's really something that is, you guys probably already know this, but doing an internship is a really great way to get into the industry or get into a company that you really want to get to. So I, 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 I may not have passed the interview for Facebook if I did the uh, the full-time position interview. But the internship interview is easier. It's the steps to get there are, are simpler. So I got in as an intern. And then from being an intern, I converted to being a full-time engineer. So that, that really made things easier for me. I mean, interviews are very stressful. They're scary. They're uh, difficult. So I avoid them as much as I can. And since 2011, I have not gone to an interview because I I'm scared of them, but I've done them to other people. Uh, <laughs> and, and now I go around the world and talk about how to do better in an interview bec just because I, I understand how stressful it can be. So yeah, OK, so let's, let's get into this. So this talk is for you. Um, I will ramble a lot. So please interrupt me. Don't be shy. Just ask a question. Raise your hand if you want to like, clarify something or I tend to go on and, and, and talk for, for a while, as you probably already saw. So uh, just feel free. Let's, let's make this more into a conversation than just like me talking at you. Um, OK, so let's talk about how to prepare for the interview. And really, when we think about preparing for an interview, we think about these three components, which is one is understanding the process and like how does the interview flow and the process before the interview and during the interview. Uh, also, understanding the material. What are the things we cover? In, in the interviews and what topics are included or not included. Um, and finally, how to communicate. So this one shows as like one third of this graph or this whatever chart. And I actually think communication is probably 50% or more of uh, succeeding in the interview. I, I interview so many people who are probably very skilled programmers, but what they come to the inter interview, their communication is really broken and they can't articulate or explain their ideas well, and it's, it's enough reason to not be able to pass the interview. So it's a really critical part of, of, of the interview. interview. And, and finally, the thing that kind of underpins this and gets you most prepared uh, is practice. And when I say practice, I don't mean just like, hey, practice one or two problems or practice one or two interviews. Try to do the interview uh, process 10, 20 times. You guys, there's quite a few, uh, a few of you around here. You can pair up and interview each other. Even if you're not experienced interviewers, it's a good way to just create that atmosphere. Because it's one thing to solve a problem alone on your laptop, and you're like comfortable and by yourself, and you can probably do it really well. But when you have somebody next to you nagging you, asking you questions about it, and watching you, and like looking at everything you type, it can be different. So getting comfortable with that and practicing that is really good. And even if you just have your cousin or your mom watch you, it's OK. Like Just having someone, even if they don't know what you're saying, um, it gives you a little bit of a taste for that and gives you more comfort with it. So let's talk about the goals of a coding interview and what, why do we even do, do these, uh, these coding interviews. So really the point is to get a sense of how you think and tackle hard problems. You know, in every job you're, you're going to have, you will be solving hard problems. That's why the job is interesting. That's why people are paying uh, you know, software engineers a lot of money because these are hard problems to solve. And we want to get a sense of how people solve these problems or tackle them during the interview. And we want to think about how you consider uh, engineer, engineering trade-offs. So you know, for software engineering positions, you're constantly designing software and making trade-offs or choices. Like, I'm going to use this approach instead of this approach. I'm going to uh, decide to spare some memory in order to make my, uh, or, or uh, at the expense of making my code take longer, or I will use more memory in order to make my code run faster. So have you, have you guys studied big O notation, or yeah. people studied that? OK, some people. Um, does anybody not know what big O notation is? Complexity, yeah, complexity analysis, big O. Everybody knows this? OK, that's amazing. So then 
then, then there's nothing to talk about here. You're, you guys already know this stuff. Um, well, we'll get to practice it a little bit. So being able to talk about your code in this complexity analysis or using big O notation is important. And it's a, it's a mandatory part of the interview. Like there will not be an, a coding interview where you don't talk about complexity analysis, where you talk about the space and time complexity of your code. And also the trade-offs. Not just like how much this takes, but also which choices did you make and why did you choose to do it this way versus that way and how did you rationalize or justify these choices. So being able to communicate that is important. How you communicate. I just said this, communication is a big part of it uh, and it's, it's, it's why we do interviews. We want to get a sense of how you communicate. Otherwise, we could give you a problem and be like, go sit in a corner by yourself and solve it and come back. We don't want that. We want to see people interact and communicate because most of the time when you're working and solving real world problems, you communicate with your coworkers and, and you come to solutions together. Also, we want to see the limits of what you know. So everybody has limits to their knowledge and, and that's okay. So in the interview, sometimes interviewers will push and ask questions after questions just to see at which point you will not know the answer. So when they, they get a sense of the boundary of your knowledge, and this helps us for a few reasons. It helps us in leveling, where we try to get a sense of what is somebody's level based on how much they know, how experienced they are in a certain domain or a certain topic. So it also means it's OK if you don't know the answer to everything that's being asked in the interview. In fact, most likely, every interview or most interviews you go to, you will come out of it not knowing some answers to questions being asked. And that's fine, just because um, you know, there are things you don't know, and it's okay. Well, unless you are more expert on the topic you're being interviewed on than the interviewer, then maybe you'll know more than them. Um, but a lot of times, you'll, you'll come out probably having some questions that you didn't answer or you couldn't answer. Uh, so I had a few, uh, a few interviews at some technical companies, and most of the time, at least in my case, I got the interview just with the HR, not someone from the technical department. <coughs> Yeah, so, so this is a very interesting remark. So some companies will do their interviews differently. And they may just you know, do like the soft skills, like you said. Or they may give you a project and tell you, take this home and come back next week and present a solution to us. So companies, different companies do this differently. Now, what I'm talking about is the kind of coding interviews that companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft does. And, and these are, you know, there's a certain style to them. And like the, you know, the whiteboarding interview as well. Now it's not whiteboard anymore because you're doing it on your computer. But they used to be called these like whiteboarding coding interviews where you're basically writing code on a whiteboard and you're usually solving a problem, like a, pro, a coding problem, like the ones from Lead Code and Hacker Rank and so on. So, Maybe some companies will just look at your resume and have a like a 30-minute chat with HR and, and decide some, you know, that's possible. Um, but I'm talking about the ones where you, you go through this. Yeah, good good point. And this people say, like, what, you know, sometimes you're applying for like a very specific position, like a React front end, you know, and they might just make you do a React project or ask you React questions, which will be different from the problems that we talk about here because You'll see that in a second. We're not going to touch on specific frameworks. So I'll get to this in the next slide. Other questions? OK. So what's covered in the interview? We said it's important to know the material, so let's talk about what's covered. And you know, a lot of times I, I talk to students or folks who, who are applying to these coding interviews, and they go by a book of puzzles. And they try to practice these kind of riddles or these logic problems. And although those problems are interesting and fun, they're actually not what we talk about or, or focus on in, in interviews. Instead, we care about things that look like this, which is data structures and algorithms. So, so let's talk about that. So data structures and algorithms are kind of like the fundamentals or like the topic that spans all the different programming languages and frameworks and different places in the stack, whether you're in front end or back end or you're doing um, other kinds of uh, different programming positions. So we use data structures or algorithms because they kind of abstract all these differences away. And when we talk about that, we want to, we care about understanding these topics, not memorizing. So it's not helpful to memorize a bunch of algorithms and come to the interview. That, that's not going to be useful because you're, you will be expected to 
use your understanding of the data structures and algorithms to solve a problem, probably a problem you have not seen before. So if you just memorize a bunch of algorithms, it's not helpful because they're not going to ask you just to repeat how binary search works. That's not interesting. So also, like I said in the previous slide, you'll be expected to discuss the complexity, the space and time complexity of your code and the trade-offs that you made. Um, we also, like I just said, like common library functions, we don't ask them or we don't ask about them. Like make a, make a function that does binary search or make a function that does merge sort. That's not interesting. These are algorithms that are well known. They've been solved many years ago. And we don't really care about just having somebody come and implement merge sort. Um, we, and and that's, that's the, the next point is that um, common, li common Well, that's what I'm going to talk about next, is that they're not going to be the basic algorithms that everybody knows. It's going to be a problem that requires you to use your understanding of algorithms and data structures to solve it. So we'll look at some examples, and you can see that. Um, sorry, so what I, the previous point that says common library functions are a fair game, what I meant to say here is that when you're solving the problem, if you need to access a library function that does sorting, it's fine. You can just call array.sort or whatever it is the thing that you want to do. You don't have to implement sort from scratch because again, we're not trying to see whether you can write a sorting algorithm. You're probably solving a bigger problem. So you can just call sort or you can use the hashing. You can use the hash map that comes from your you know, programming language, the default stuff. Um, we also don't ask specific questions about concepts. So this is kind of going back to the point about React. You know, in an interview that is for generalist software engineer position, we're not going to ask you to tell us how React hooks work or how state management in iOS 13 works, because these are very specific concepts. And it requires you to have worked with React or iOS to know the answer to this. And we assume that people can figure this out. If you come as a generalist software position, a software engineer, and you're going to come work, you might work on React, you might work on iOS, you might work on Android. And if you know the basics and you have good problem solving skills, then we trust that you can figure out the frameworks or the, the, the languages or the concepts that you need for the job. Now, there's an exception where if you are applying for a position that requires you to be an expert, like they're looking for an expert iOS engineer, then yes, probably they will talk or ask you about iOS specific questions or expert in VR or expert in machine learning. Then in that case, the, the the interview will touch on those topics and dive deeper in them. Finally, use your most comfortable language. So this is something that people are surprised by. They say, OK, which programming language I should use for my interviews? The answer is whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, the interviewer will be able to follow along, whether you use C Sharp or Java or JavaScript. Even if they don't know it, they can probably understand what you're doing. And don't try to code in a language that you don't know. This is not good for you. It's not good for the interviewer, and it's going to just show that you're inexperienced when you could just be inexperienced in that particular language. If you forget the semicolons or you forget how to do a certain initialization in, in like Golang, you know, Golang is weird. It has these weird things how you initialize variables. And you suddenly decide to use Golang for your interview, and you're stumbling around and forgetting the syntax, and it might look like actually you don't know how to code. But maybe it's just that you don't know how to code in Golang. So it will confuse you and confuse the interviewer. So just use the one that you're most comfortable with and you've been using the most uh, in the recent past. OK. So quickly, let's go through the format of a coding interview. Uh, the first part is just an intro. We want to just learn about yourself. And we want to learn about you and just kind of do a little introduction. It'll take like two or three minutes. And then we get into coding. And that's going to be the majority of the interview. So you'll be completing a, a coding problem. Um, it could be one or two problems, depending on the time or depending on how you do. Usually what I do is I ask one easy problem that's intended to take about 10, 15 minutes, and then ask a slightly more difficult problem that takes up the rest of the interview. So the whole time of the interview is 45 minutes long. Again, this is in the case of the Facebook interviews, uh, which is also similar to how other companies do it. And you know we get a few minutes of intro at the beginning, about 35 minutes of coding, which, which is going to be split up between either one large problem or two problems that are uh, of smaller size. Now, 
sometimes the interviewer might stop you and, and just kind of move on to another part. That's okay. Don't worry. They might have a certain plan or certain things they're looking for. They want to get signal on. So just follow the lead of the interviewer. Or they may see that you're really stuck in this problem. You're not making any progress. It's not a good one. Let's change the problem and see if there's going to be uh, other results for it. So also, there might be follow-up components depending on how you solve the problem. So you may solve it, and then we say, all right, let's now make it a little bit harder. Let's see how you do when the problem and complexity or difficulties increase. Or let's try to solve this in a more optimal way. You know, you may have solved it in n log n. Let's see if we can solve it in linear time. Or let's try to use more, more uh, let's try to use uh, less space. Or let's clean up the code a little, make it less complex. So there could be follow-up depending on the solution you have. Now, this is a very important one. This actually should be involved. Be prepared to test your code. If you just come and you um, solve a problem, and then at the end of it you say, all right, I'm done. Give me the job. That, 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 that's going to be instantly failing the interview. Because skipping the part where you test the code is critical. And you know, people fail the interview just because they didn't test their code. A lot of times, you actually find bugs in your code when you test it. And it shows you know, that you, had to, you, you, you can improve your code. It's OK to make mistakes or have bugs in your code as long as you can catch them. And that's why we test. That's why we test code in real life. Because you know, we all know that you know, writing code doesn't always work on the first time. And we have these manual tests. We have automated tests. So don't skip this step. Always test your code. Don't wait for the interviewer to tell you to test your code. Make sure you're prompt and you're the one initiating that. If you're doing a phone screen, which nowadays most interview or all interviews are actually over the phone, so you'll just be using an online tool. Testing your code does not mean you get to hit execute. The way you test your code is by running through it and stepping through it line by line. So it's like you're writing it on the whiteboard. Even if now you're doing the code on the computer with a tool that lets you run code, we don't actually uh, enable code execution. So you'll just step through it like you wrote it on a piece of paper. And finally, at the end of the interview, you have an opportunity to ask questions. This is kind of your chance to interview the company and learn about the workplace, culture, and so on. OK. So one more slide, I promise. I know, I know I've been talking for a while. One more slide, and then we'll get to do some problems together. So this slide is probably the most important slide in this session. So just give me your attention for five more minutes, and then um, we'll, we'll have a little more fun with this. So, Steps to a successful interview. What do you got to do uh, to, have, to have a successful interview? So number one, you come to the interview and you hear the question. Oftentimes, people are eager. They want to just, they hear the question, they want to jump to solving the question. They say, oh, yeah, I know how to do this. And no, that's not good. The first thing you want to do when you hear the question is you want to repeat the question. And this will take you like 20 seconds. But... It's good because it'll make sure you and the interviewer are on the same page of what the interviewer is asking. A lot of the times, the interviewer may verbally say the question to you. They don't write it. So just repeating the question gives you a chance to verify that you understand the same thing. And it, sounds, it might sound trivial. Like, why is this such a big deal? But a lot of times, I interview people, and they start solving the problem without repeating the question and verifying. And it takes them 10, 15 minutes, or it takes me 10, 15 minutes to realize that actually they're solving the wrong problem. This is not even what I asked. And then that is you know, a third of the interview wasted. So just repeat the question. It'll take 20 seconds. Now, after you repeat the question, you can start solving it, right? No, you don't solve it yet. You ask questions about the question. And so this is, this is the case with just about every kind of interview, not just about coding interviews. Even if you're doing a design interview, um, asking questions about the problem to make sure you understand it some more, you understand the constraints, the parameters of it. If there are any assumptions you're making, verifying your assumption and making sure that these assumption, assumptions are actually valid to this, to this problem. So this is a good time if, you, you know, if you're solving a problem with arrays, then asking, hey, what is going to be inside this array? Is it all numbers? Are the, is the array ever empty? Is, there ever, is the array ever so large that it does not fit in memory? Maybe I have to read it from a database. Maybe I have to read it from disk. So, Asking questions about all these scenarios is, is, is really important. Now, OK, you ask questions. So you can start solving the problem, right? Or you can start coding, right? I mean, it's a coding interview. When do we start coding? No, you don't start coding yet. You think about the solution. And this is also important. A lot of times, people just like, as soon as they hear the thing, they start writing code. Don't write code. 
talk about the solution first. Try to sketch it out. If you have a whiteboard or notes next to you, try to draw up the solution. Make sure that actually the idea or the approach that you're using works before you try to code it. The, part of the, the coding part is actually the easy part. If you can figure out the high level approach and you can break it into components or steps, then taking your algorithm or taking your code from, from just understanding it to converting it to code is relatively easy. So make sure you spend enough time on that step where you, where you talk about a solution and understand it enough before you start coding it. And this is also a step where people fail a lot because they don't validate their solution early enough and they start coding and they spend you know, 20 minutes coding and they realize, wait a minute, this doesn't actually work. It only works in like one case, but it doesn't work in a general scenario. So making sure it also works in, in edge cases. Okay. So then you start coding. Once you do that, once you've figured out a, a, a good approach, you feel confident about it, then you start writing some code. The whole time that you're writing the code, you're narrating it. And you're commenting on it. I'm here, I'm putting a for loop that's going to go from the beginning to the middle of the array. Here, I'm putting an if statement that's going to check if this pointer is going to go after this pointer. Here, I'm going to do a while loop because while loops are blah, blah, blah. So you're going to just narrate your code the whole time as if you're putting comments in because Never, never write comments in your code in the interview because that's just going to waste your time. But narrate the code as if you're documenting it or, or commenting it for other people to be able to read it. The interviewer is listening and, follow and paying attention to what you're saying. If you run into trouble, sometimes it's OK to ask hint for hints. But don't do it so much that you're um, going to have the interviewer solve the problem for you. And then once you finish coding, you run through some tests. So remember, the tests are going to be manual tests. You, you come up with a bunch of test cases or test scenarios, and then you go through them through your algorithm or your code line by line. You go through this if statement, you go through this while loop, you go through this for loop, and you check what's going on with the data. At every iteration of the while loop, how is my data changing? How is my array growing or shrinking? What's happening to this variable? What's going on? So basically, you play the role of the computer and execute your code as if you are the computer. And this is really important. A lot of times, People forget that. And they, instead of looking at what the code is saying and trying to follow the code, they, what they do is they, they do what they want the code to do, which is sometimes inconsistent. So you may write a for loop that's going to be from 0 to n plus 1. And your array has n elements. And, the, and, and, and you wrote this for loop thinking, well, I just want the for loop to go from the beginning to the end of the array. But you have, you have the for loop going to n plus 1. So if you follow the for loop step by step, you'll realize that this for loop is going to overflow and you're going to try to go beyond the array. But if you're just following, like, yeah, I wrote a for loop that's going to go from the beginning to the end of the array, then you won't check, does it actually go from the beginning to the end of the array? So when you, when you test your code, test it as if you didn't write it yourself. Just like basically close your eyes and then forget everything you wrote and then open your eyes and look at it again and think, like, all right, this is code. I've never seen it before. Let me just run through it. Yes? Yeah, so we, we, the reason we discourage execution because we want to see you and hear you test your code verbally. We want to see how you run through the code. We want to see, are you, do you understand what the code does? Or is it just like a stroke of luck that you hit run and it worked? And you don't know how or why it worked. So it's like, it gives us an opportunity to validate twice. Like, not only can you write the code, but you actually understand what the code is doing line by line. So that's why we do manual testing. And this is how we've always done interviews. We, I mean, when we, when we used to do them on the whiteboard, you can't hit execute on the whiteboard. So it's basically, we're, we're, we're treating it still like a whiteboard interview, even if we're doing it over Zoom or whatever. But a good question, and there's people who argue against that. They say, like, that's a waste of time. I, don't need, I, never, I never have to run my code manually in real life. But in the interview environment, we're trying to gauge your understanding of these, these uh, coding uh, principles. So, so that's why we do that. Follow up. Like, generally, you, for good questions, you might have like four or five edge cases, let's say. So do you manually execute on each of them, or with two or three you're done, and then the rest you can execute? Because it may, like you said, you just have 45 minutes for the whole yeah. interview. And if you take a lot of time, because testing will take time if you're doing it manually. For example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you take a lot of time on that, so that's what I'm asking, like, it's a trade-off or not? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a good point you bring. I think we still would like to see, for every unique edge case, to see you go through it, because we want to see, like, is this edge case going to enter inside this if statement? Is it going to enter inside this for loop? And how will your code handle you know, these different code paths? Basically, it, by, by, by we say edge cases, we're trying to execute all code paths, right? And we want to see that you understand what even code paths mean, and you can run and, and um, exhaust all the paths in your code to make sure they all work correctly. And when you think about edge cases, you know, think about things like what happens when the array is empty. Am I ever going to have null pointers? Am I ever going to have z division by zero? Am I ever going to have other kinds of uh, exceptions or scenarios that, that I need to watch out for? You had a question? Yeah, I had a question about the step three when thinking about the solution, how to have like, some coding issues with and uh, how it's critical. Like, is it very critical to stop while you're thinking about the solution? Usually when you're thinking, you need some time to just focus on it, be silent. Yeah. When you're silent, like the atmosphere is not good. So while thinking, you should also talk. Uh, but what is your advice on how time should I take for just thinking in silence? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a trade-off. And obviously, everybody's different. Some people are you know, loud thinkers. So they, they like talking while they're thinking. Some people are quiet thinkers. And I don't think you need to force yourself to be a loud thinker. Uh, to be able to make it through the interview. However, if you need moments of silence, like take take your minutes to like think through something, but also make sure you have these like checkpoints or check-ins with the interviewer. Like this is this is kind of the direction I'm going in. This is the this is the thinking I'm I'm having, because a big part of the interview is also understanding your thinking process, not just like going in a corner, being quiet and silent, and then like coming up and be like, all right, this is the solution, and just like this black box of thoughts that. The interviewer doesn't know, and how did you get it? Did you just like Google it and find out the answer? Like they wanna, they wanna see your process of how you arrived at the solution. So it's it's important to communicate. But I understand what you're saying, and I think somehow finding that balance, and this is what you will get better at by practicing. And you know you'll learn to find the time to think quietly and then talk out loud and so on. Okay. Other questions. Well, one more step on this slide, and then we can, we can pause. Uh, so after you do the test cases, uh, you might find some bugs, fix them. Most of the time, people find bugs in their code when they do the test cases, and that's OK. Like I said, uh, just make sure you fix them, and you know how to fix them. And finally, you iterate through your code. So if there is time, you may try to make it better. You may try to make it use less memory. You may try to make it uh, use, use less time. And it depends. Maybe there is no iterations or improvements to make, and that's it. This is the best code you can write. And, and that's possible. So all right, this is it. That's, that's the, the, the meat of the workshop. Now, we're going to do some problems together. So we'll, we'll have, a few, I have a few practice problems that we can solve them together, and uh, we can kind of play with these different scenarios in, in the interview. But any questions up until this point? No? All right. So let's do this. So I'm going to take a problem that's pretty, that's kind of trivial or easy, but we'll try to play with different parameters of it. And then we'll try to make, uh, we'll try to take another problem that's a little harder. And then, um, and then we, we, you know, we go home. Um, OK. So, so here's a problem. It says, given an array in which every number is between 1 and n, determine if there are any duplicates. So, so you come to the interview, and you know, this is what the interviewer says. They give you this problem. What do you do? What's the first thing you do? How big is n? Not yet. What's the first step? Yeah, exactly. You repeat the question. So you're like, all right, just to make sure I understand, I'm writing an algorithm that determines if an array has any duplicates. So you repeat the question, the interviewer says, yes, that's, that's what we want. That's correct. <coughs> so, so you repeat the question, you say that. Now, what's the next step? After, but, yeah. So now you ask questions about the the problem. So yeah, one of the questions both of you guys asked it is, well, how big is n? What are the constraints of n? And we can say here in this case n is just max integer. So it's not so huge that you have to worry about it. It's just a normal number, normal integer. What other questions would you ask about this? Um, it's a yes or no answer, right? About the question. If it has duplicate, yes or no. That's yeah, exactly. Like what is 
what should we return? Like, what is our function doing? Is it returning yes or no? Is it returning how many duplicates? Is it returning the value of the duplicates? Is it returning the duplicates? Is it, what is it doing? Is it returning the index of the duplicates? So in this case, it's just yes or no, true or false. That's all we care about. What else would you ask? Yeah, what other questions would you ask? It would have been, well, it, yeah, you I mean you have to code it. Yeah, yeah. This is, a, this is a question that you will solve by coding it. But I'm saying, what other questions would you ask about this problem to understand it better? Before you can solve it, what do you need to know? Yeah. Uh, I was asking if an array of all the integers or does it have all the elements? Yeah, exactly. Are there other things in the array? Is it just maybe like some, there's potentially nulls or garbage values in the array, or is it all integers? In this case, we'll say it's all integers. That's a, that's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah, so these are two questions. What are the limitations on time? Am I trying to operate in certain time constraints? And the answer to this will always be, do your best. Solve it in the best time, time that you can. The interviewer is not going to tell you, I want you to solve it in O of n, or I want you to solve it in n log n, or n squared, or n cubed, or whatever. Because they will, you know, that'll give away some hints, or they'll, like, like well, okay, it's possible to solve it in linear, so I need to... They want you to figure out what is really the, pos the most optimal one. So, so in this case, do your best for the time. And you said about the, how big is the array? Yeah, we can assume the array could be huge, but it's not going to be so huge that you have to handle any special case. Like, it could be, could be a huge array. It could fill up the whole memory, but you don't have to worry about, you know, chunking it or breaking it into different files or anything like that. What else? Other questions you guys have? The range of the numbers? Yeah, so we said the numbers are from 1 to n, and we said n is max integer. So, so any, anywhere between 1 and max int. OK, so a few questions I, I had thought about, too, is can I destroy or modify the array? This is very important. Is this array read only, or can I, can I play with it? Now, you'll see how that changes the answer. Um, in this case, we'll say no. The array is read only. You cannot modify it. Can I use additional space? And again, people ask this a lot. And a lot of the times, I say, when they ask me, can I use additional space? It's like the question you said, how much time should I take to solve this? The answer is, do your best. If you can avoid using additional space, that's good. But if you have to, that's fine. Will the array ever be empty? And maybe this is a question that doesn't matter. Maybe your code will always work whether it's empty or not. But if it's empty, what do we return? And in this case, an empty array has no duplicates, so simply we return false. Are they all integers? You guys already asked this. What's the data type in the array? So in this case, they're all integers, yes. OK. So now, after we did step two, which is asking questions, the next step is let's think about this. How can we solve this problem? So what are you guys thinking? Any any? Any thoughts here? We said, remember, remember the concern. I'm not going to repeat them. Supposedly, you were paying attention. So we'll see if you are. Yeah, what do you think? We can sort, sort. OK, well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You can sort the array. But what did we just say? You can't modify it. I can make more memory. I can copy. But we said, what did we say about memory? You can't do your best. We said, don't use more memory. And we said, don't modify the array. So both of these ideas are, 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 are not going to. Yeah, so, so, so you say, all right, I mean, basically you're cornering me into this solution. Now, you, I can't modify the array. I can't make a copy of the array. So like, all I can do is this simple brute force solution that's going to look at every number. So we go from you know, 0 to the end of the array. And for every number, we stop, and we check if that number appears again in the array. And we just keep doing this. So we'll need two loops. For every number, we'll loop over all the numbers. And we need two nested loops. And this is not ideal in terms of time, but that's the best we can do given the constraints of the problem. So this is what the code would look like. Now we're, we're writing this in Java. And it's going to have the outer for loop. It's going to go from 0 to uh, length minus 1 for i. And the second loop is for j from i to length minus 1 as well. And we always check if i and j plus 1 are ever equal. It means we found a duplicate. That means we have to return true. 
Otherwise, if we complete these two for loops and we never find two elements that are the same, that means no duplicates, we can safely return false. So what's going to be the complexity of this now? Yeah, so, so yeah, n squared here, that's a complexity. And that's, that's a good starting point for this problem, but uh, we can try to do better if we relax some of the constraints on the problem. Now, there's a bug in this code. Yeah, what is it? What is it? J plus one. Yeah, so, so, so this J, J uh, loop is running to the end of the array. It's running to the last element, which is uh, n minus one. But we're doing J plus one here. So at some point, we're actually going to try to access the element beyond the last element. And that's going to give us in Java uh, index out of bound exception. So this code will actually never run in real time. Unless we have an empty array. Um, I hope there is not another bug, because then it means I don't know how to code. <laughs> um, OK, so, so you say, all right, let's relax one of the constraints. Let's say you can modify the array. So if, if you can modify the array, what would you do to it? I want to hear from people who haven't spoken. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, what, what would that do? Uh, basically, that would put us all the elements from the smallest to the biggest. Yeah. Then I can run the one loop that will check always the next element that's the same. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and what would that do to the complexity? Like what? You will be linear. And login. And wait, we'll be and login. Yeah, exactly. So then you do this. So you say, all right, let me sort the array. And like, like you, you were saying, you know, it's now I don't need to do these two for loops because now if there are any duplicates, they'll be next to each other. So this will be the code. Uh, we'll just have one loop that's going to go from 0 to length minus 2 in this case because we're checking neighbors. And we're always going to check i and i plus 1. If they're ever equal, return true. Otherwise, if there is no, um, if the for loop finishes with never two elements that are neighbors that are equal, it means there are no duplicates because it's sorted then we can safely return false. Now, I might be over explaining this, and all of you guys seem to already know and understand how this works, but this is the kind of explanation you want to give during the interview. You want to walk the interviewer through the code in this way and say, this is why I'm writing it this way. This is the choices I'm making. And like we were saying, you know, even though we only have one linear loop here, this actually is going to be n log n because the complexity of the program is determined by the slowest part of the program. In this case, the sorting algorithm is the slowest part. Even if it's the best sorting algorithm in the world, it's going to do n log n. So that's our code. Now, how many people here are experienced Java developers or Java? Java. So for people who write Java code, you write Java code? <laughs> I was watching you write some CSS the other day. <laughs> CSS and Java don't go together. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yeah, but this is a Java thing. So for people who write Java, there's a, there's a problem in this, in this code, too. Yeah, what do you think, Anya? In what? Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, what is it? What do you think? A dot length? A length? A dot length is a variable in. in it's a function, right? Yeah, in Java this works. So a dot length actually works in Java. What do you think? I mean, in Java we use that arrays, arrays dot sort and make. Exactly. So exactly. So in Java, a as you see, the type of A is actually a primitive type of integer, which means it's, it's not an object that has functions. Now, it has a special field called length, and that's this Java, but it doesn't have functions. You can't invoke, f or methods, you can't invoke a method on it like A.sort. So, so this is a problem. So normally, the way you would start an array of primitive data type like this one is you would do arrays.sort. And the reason I'm showing you this is to say, know your language. If you're a experienced Java developer, you would not write this code because you know that a.sort is not a valid way to sort an array of this data type. 
And this would actually be a compile error or like a, a problem that happens at compile time because there's a mismatch of data type. And when an interviewer sees this, if your interviewer is experienced with Java and they see you writing this, they will say, wait a minute, why would somebody who knows Java write this kind of code? This doesn't make sense. Maybe you don't know coding very well or maybe you just don't know Java coding very well. And so it's okay to not be experienced in Java, but if you are, if you say you've been writing code for a while, then you wouldn't make this kind of mistake. So just make sure you use your most comfortable language. Okay, so now we are now doing n log n. Let's relax one more constraint. We say we can use additional space. Can we do better? Yeah, so now we're saying if we, if we can use additional space, what, what, what do we do? What do you think? Yeah, exactly. So if we use a hash table, what would that do? How is that going to solve the problem? Yeah. And what's the trade-off that we're making here? Exactly. Exactly. So this. What's that? Yeah. So the the amortized uh, lookup for the amortized lookup for hash tables is O of one. And we're going to do n lookups in the hash table, so we would have O of, one, o of n com complexity. So yes, so we use hash tables now. We're switching to Java, JavaScript. So we're going to initialize a hash table, just an empty object. And we're going to just run a for loop from 0 to the end of the array. And inside the for loop, each time we check, have we already seen this number? Check the hash table. Has this number already been added to the hash table? If it has been added, it means it appeared previously in the array. That means it's a duplicate. That means now it appears twice. So we can return true if we ever see it. If not, we just say, OK, we've seen this number now. Make it true. We saw it. Cool. So we do this over and over again. If we never see a number twice, we will just break out of the loop and return false. Otherwise, we would have returned true previously. So now this is using additional memory because we are using a hash table or an object in JavaScript. And that's going to be potentially as big as the array. This, can, this object can grow to take up as, as much memory as n elements, if that's what the array has. And so now we have the complexity for space is O of n. But what's the time complexity? It's also O of n, because we just have a linear loop. And we're assuming the lookup for a hash table is linear. The lookup and insertion. Because what we're doing, we're looking up in, inside every loop. We're looking up once, and we're inserting once. So we assume the lookup and insertion is O of 1 constant time. Then we have O of n uh, time and space. So now, to be honest, this problem is too trivial to come up in an interview. It's too easy. But I'm showing it just to show you the different ways you can solve the same problem. Each one of them has different trade-offs. And this is what I said at the beginning. Trade-offs are important. So if you, you saw three different solutions for the same problem, each of them has different constraints and different choices. In the first one, we had an n squared solution that did not modify the array and did not use additional space. In the second solution, we, used, um, a, uh, we modified the array. Or we could have also solved it by using additional space of n if we so copied the array and sorted it, if we don't want to modify the original array. And in the final solution, we used additional n space uh, but kept the time complexity linear. And these are the kind of discussions you would be having in interviews. Now, the problem will usually be more difficult, more complex, but you can usually um, do it in, in different ways. Now, we can also make a Boolean uh, array, and just when we have the number, just make it true, and whenever I had it another time, I'll just. So, what would that require in order to do that? What would that require? Exactly. Yeah. So, so exactly. You would need an array as big as max int to be, if you want to index the array by the value. Yeah. So, so exactly. Yeah. One, I don't know. Maybe we can do it in O of n. Like if you make, we have one to n array already. Let's say if I loop through every element. So, let's say I have a number five at index zero. So, I place number five at index n minus one, which is four, and I put it as 0. 
So every number I have seen at that particular index, everything will be zero. And no, not really. I mean, what if the array looks like what if the array looks like this? Let's do something. What if this is what the array looks like? Okay, I'm fucked. If the numbers are then the length of the array, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was capital N. It wasn't lowercase. It was uppercase N. Yeah. Now, good point. Actually, there is a cool solution to this problem that could be solved in linear time and constant space if the numbers are from one the yeah if the numbers are from one to the length of the array and the and there are only at most one duplicates then what can we do do you guys can you guys guess if if like basically this is like the array like one two and two or like we get one one two and so on. I mean, that, and then an array with no duplicates would look like this. So, can you guess how we would solve this? Even if it has more duplicates, the solution is going to Oh, sorry, it's not, it's not clear. No, no, so, so I'm saying if the numbers are from 1 to n, n in here, in this case, small n, the, the length of the array. So, it could, it could look like 1, 2, 2, this is an array with a duplicate. One one two. This is an array with also a duplicate. What's that? Yeah. What would you do? And we're saying there could be at most one duplicate. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. So. So if the numbers are supposed to be from 1 to n to fill up the whole array of size n, that means there is an expected value for the sum. There's a formula of the sum of all numbers, you know, the sum of numbers from 1 to n is equal to what? n. So there's, there's this formula that tells you all the numbers from 1 to n, this is their sum, and it's an expected value. So if we could just sum up all the numbers. If they don't give us this value, that means there's a duplicate. This only works if there's at most one duplicate. Because the number, the expected sum of numbers from 1 to 3 is 6. So this is the sum of this one is 6. The sum of this one is 4. The sum of this one is 5. So that means these ones have a duplicate. This one does not. But if there is more than one duplicate, for example, you could have 2, 2, and 2. So that could give you a 6, but there is a duplicate. So that's why for this to work, you have to say the constraint is there is at most one duplicate. Does that make sense? Yeah, for more duplicates, but you have one more solution for this kind of a problem. Like you see a 2, right? Yeah. I'll put that 2, I'll go to 2 minus 1. At index 1, I'll put a 0. And then you go to next element. That is 2. That was at index 1. So you put a 0 at 1. Oh, I see, I see. And then. I've so if you have seen element 2 before, at the 1 index, right. you'll see a 0 as soon as you see it. So it's but so that, what that will do to you is that it'll... Any it'll, number of duplicates will work. It, if the length is still in. It'll make, it'll make your array... Uh, it'll, it'll, you'll lose the original array. Yeah, you will lose the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's another, another interesting but solution. Will not work, you know, because we may set 0 to something in the future. And like, we're in position i, we're setting 0 to some position j, which is after i. That's a good point too. Yeah. That okay. Here we go. You're you're once again. You're you're you. <laughs> well, this is good. We're we're solving problems now. I want to give you guys a problem to solve yourself, and maybe we'll take. Um, well, we'll see. Let's. I'll give you the problem and see what you think. So this this one actually is a real interview problem. I asked this question. But now I can't ask it because I just showed it to you guys. Where is it? No, that's not the question. Um, OK, so, so it says, the problem says, given an array, write an algorithm to move all non-zero elements to the left of the array. So again, you know, the, we said the first thing, you repeat the question, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> Hold up, hold up. Let, there's, there's a lot of questions you need to ask about this problem. There's, there's quite a few questions, actually, to be asked. 
about this problem. So, and, and, and the way these questions are answered also will determine your solution. Um, so so let's, let's go through it. Let's see what kind of questions do you want to ask. Yeah, what do you? Uh, are, what is the type of the elements in the array? Yeah, so uh, as well, they will be all integers in this case. Again, try to solve okay. it without if you can. If you can solve it without additional memory, that would be good. If you have to, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, you have to because you're moving. You're moving the non-zero elements. No, no. You you will modify the original array in this case. Yeah. That's a very good question. I'm so glad you asked it because most people don't ask this question. Do we need to preserve the order, the relative order of the non-zero elements when we move them to the left? Do they need to be in the same order? We'll say no. You don't have to keep the same order. So you, they could be, you, could, you could mess with the order. Now, remember, I only said to you, move the non-zeros to the left. I didn't say anything about the zeros. Yeah, so that's a good question. What do we do with the zeros? Actually, we don't care. Again, in this problem, we don't care what happens to the zeros. So you don't necessarily need to move them to the right of the array. I just want all the non-zeros to be at the front of the array, at the beginning of the array. And in this case, the function, if you're going to write this as a function, will return the number of non-zero elements. So, so basically, imagine we're going to, if we were consuming this array, somebody else will consume this array. They will have moved all the non-zeros to the left, and they will just read the first x elements to know these are your non-zeros. Everything else could be a zero, could be whatever. We don't care about it. We just care about these first x elements there at the front, and they're your non-zeros. Yeah, we don't, we don't care about the order. Even for the positive Yes, for the positive numbers. We, we don't care about, in this case, the relative order, because of course the order of the array will change, but the relative order of the positive numbers, we don't care about it. So these are the questions. Does the array only contain numbers? You asked this, yes. Can we use extra memory? Do your best. Try not to. What goes on the right side of the array where the zeros were? Again, we don't care. Does the order matter? Good question. No, it does not. And what is the runtime? In this case, try to do it better than n squared. Because this is a sub-problem of sorting, and sorting can be done in n log n. So we should be able to do it even better than n log n, in theory. So take a shot at this. Let's take maybe five minutes, see, if, see what you can come up with. And you, you do it. Do it yourself. So you have a question? No, I have Yeah, to, to just, we'll just take five minutes. Yeah, you're too fast, man. We need, we need some time. So try to do it, and then we can. Uh, we can come together and do it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And you said the function is going to return the amount of zero elements. The number of non zero elements. Okay. Yeah. So, so normally, you know, to be, to be fair to a candidate, the way I would do this, I would actually try to give an example. If the interviewer does not give you an example, do that. Before you solve it, just be like, all right, hold on a second. Let me, let me make sure I understand this. So, if my array looks like this, <coughs> then the, the, the result of my function should do something like, and maybe here there could be a 0 or it could be whatever. So I'll just put a question mark. And the return value, this should return 3. So this is really important, too. I maybe should have said this. Do not solve any problem before you actually have an, at least one example to make sure you, you, you get it. Especially, like for the duplicates, maybe it was obvious what duplicates mean. But for this one, maybe it's a little confusing. And you can say, so this is an acceptable solution. Also, this is an acceptable solution. So making sure that we understand the order doesn't matter. What does that actually mean? One more question. Yeah. No, we want, we, 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 we actually, the return value should be an integer. This function returns an integer. 
And the answer is going to be in the original array. So you can't, you can't return an additional array. Because the return value of this should be an integer. What's that? Yeah, the, the program returns an integer, and the original array will be changed. An integer of all the non-zero, yeah. Yeah. So, so making a copy doesn't make sense in this case, because if you make a copy, yeah, you will lose it. You will lose it inside the function. I guess you could make a copy and then copy it back to the original function, if you want. Is that what you were asking? Or? Yeah. yeah. One more question. Yeah. Can we have negative numbers in the array as well? Sure, you can. Sure, you can. Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah, they could. Good question too. Man, I am thirsty. Is there water here to drink? I need a glass, huh? Yeah, I can help you out. I can bring from downstairs. Yeah, are you still rolling? Are you recording? I will just set the camera to the to the board. To the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So people are discussing. What do you got? You guys, you guys got something? You got. I think I have the linear solution with constant space. So. Yeah, but uh, we don't know how to solve the problem if we have like a lot of zeros. Uh, that I, I know how to solve the well, problem. Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You're, what, what, what are you trying to optimize if there's a lot of zeros? So, yeah, basically our idea is that we have an anchor uh, of an index of the last zero element. Okay. Yeah, and we just go through the array, and if the next element is non-zero, we just swap them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I don't think about the corner case and we have like you know, three zeros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three consecutive zeros. That, that's a good idea. You can optimize it for you if you have a lot of zeros. So yeah, this is a problem that you can solve it in a lot of different ways. Yeah. What are you thinking? Are you? I'm thinking I have a very dumb solution. I can tell you my solution. Well, I think I'll ask somebody to come up and solve it. We'll see. It will be interesting. What are you thinking? It's okay. You can start with a, the, the dumb solution and make it smarter. What I was thinking is just to go to go like which number it sits here. We just delete it. You delete it. Yeah. So that's that's a that's an idea that would work. What's what's what? Why is it bad? I don't know. I just saw that it was like way simple. So there's something there. There's definitely something. Thank you so much. There's definitely something better. And do you do you understand about complexity and those things? Yeah. 
been a while since I've done it, so I'm a bit rusty on yeah, the yeah, yeah. So I'm like... Because removing an element costs a lot of time, because you have to rearrange the whole array. So every time you remove an element, you, you incur n steps, potentially. And if you do this n times, your solution becomes n squared. So that's... So think, think some more if you can avoid removing things. Can you swap things? That's, that's, that's the direction you want to think about. Yeah, what's up? A potential solution, I just want to know if we are going in the right direction. So first of all, we maintain an index at one memory, at yeah. one variable, let's say i equals zero, then we loop through elements. So whenever we encounter a non-zero element, we replace that, that index and yeah. then we increment i. So i starts at zero. Yeah, yeah. And moving through my elements, as soon as I find a non-zero So you have like two, two indexes that are, one is ahead of the other. No, just one. I just have i equals zero. Yeah. I start looping as soon as I find a non-zero element. Yeah. I put it at that i is index. Yeah. That index I put it there and I replace the zero with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I go forward. Yeah. The same yeah. That 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 could work. That's a good start. Let's let's all right. Let's let's come back and see. Um, let's see let's see what you guys got. Does does hey guys, hey guys 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 come on. So, that, um, so does anybody feel excited to solve this problem on the board? Okay, we got a few hands. We got we got a few hands. Yeah, you you you're in the back. You haven't said much. Yeah, come on up. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. So now, basically, I'm like I'm your interviewer. And you're solving, so you're getting a free practice interview right now. And you, you, know, you got to talk to your friends about the problem, so you have a little bit of a head start. Um, so go ahead and, and pretend that you know, we're, you got 20 people watching you do an interview, so no pressure. <laughs> and, and maybe like 2,000 people on the camera. <laughs> no pressure, yeah. So what are you thinking? So we have to write. My algorithm is I'm not, I'm not going to remove any elements. Yeah. I'm just changing the order of the elements. Yeah. And at the end, I will have the the non-zero elements at the left and the zero elements. Okay. Right. So I have the the right the elements. Hey guys, guys, give us your attention now. You know he's he's putting himself out there to. Yeah. And we have two pointers. Yeah. One at the beginning and one at the end. Okay. And I would, be, I would be doing this several times until the points go okay. in the position. So I will ask, is this element, the element that the first pointer is, and that is zero? Yeah. OK, no. First of all, let me ask for the end. Mm. Is that element a zero? Yeah. If that element is a zero, then I will go to the left. OK. Because this element at the end. Yeah. The end. I, I'm going to do that. Uh, until I found one non-zero element on the, the right yeah. uh, And then we ask, now, is this element a zero? In this case, I will swap the yeah. elements. So the zero are going to go to the end. Yeah. And the non-zero elements are going to go to the left. And after that, this pointer will move to the right, and this pointer will move Yeah. Right. OK. Uh, this pointer are going to go closer. Uh, at the end, uh, all the non-zero elements will, will go to the, will be on the left, yeah. and the zero elements will be the right. Yeah. And the time complexity of that is all n. Okay. All right. Let's see the code. The code? Yeah. Code it. Okay. This, this is it. Coding in the board? Yeah. Yeah. That's how we do coding <laughs> interviews. No, you gotta know how to code on the whiteboard. This is how we code. Okay. We code on the board. We, we don't code on laptops at Facebook. We just write the code on the board and. So somebody else writes it on the computer. <laughs> you can yeah, you can choose whatever language you want. Yeah. Is that a triangle or a ray? That's A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good, yeah, right. I thought it was a triangle, but it looks yeah, now it looks <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> is 
Bisa naik ke? Ya, ya, ya. Yeah, good catch. <laughs> Sip of love, guys. <laughs> so, <coughs> again. I don't have swap. Only show me Python. But you can make your own swap. Yeah, what does swapping look like? I need to define the. Swap Just do it. Do it in line. Do it in line. Just do the swapping. Okay. Yeah, do the swapping in line. Yeah, so this, this is real good. So what do you do? What do you do now? Yeah, this is great. So now here's an honesty check. Did you come up with this or you looked it up on Google? No, no, I figured out. You figured out? Okay, this is, this is really good. This, this solution is actually the ideal or the optimal solution that I look for in, in an interview. Now, if you test it, you'll notice that there are probably some bugs to fix in it. Can you can you can you can you see them? Or if anybody wants to call out uh, if you see any bugs in this code. Yeah, where do you define left and right? Is A left and B is right, or how how do you do it? Because there's a node that's left that's right, right? So the number if it's smaller than the figure, it goes to the left. Bigger than the figure, it goes to the right, right? So he's he's using A and B yeah, as left hand. Pointers are A is the left and B is the right. Can you figure out the? You need to check if B like equals to L. So if the pin is zero, I can. What? So if they're all zero elements. Oh. Okay. What? All all zero elements. So what is happening? Yeah, all zero elements. Uh, we're going to end in the, in the first if all the time, and the pointer of the right is going to go to the left. Yeah. And if that any zero, it's going to the opposite. Yeah, the left. first element was an okay. So actually, I, I misspoke. I think I, the only thing I see that's missing is decrementing b here. There's no need to do it. It's not no, necessary. In the, in the next iteration? Yeah, you 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 will be able. So it's actually it's not a bug. It's just one step that would spare you an iteration. But yeah, I think this actually works, yeah. just the way it is. There are no issues with it. So 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 th this is great. Thank you so much. This is. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I I I. I, I <laughs> Yeah, I was hoping you would make some mistakes, but I'm I'm thinking you copied this from Google. But hey, you're saying you're, you're saying you got this. So, so, th so this is this is actually uh, this is actually the 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 optimal solution I look for. A lot of candidates that I interview would solve it in another way. That is usually they have um, 
they usually just go from the left side of the array all the way to the right, not from the right and left. And that one also works. Now, there's one tiny optimization that could be made here. And this is usually what I, what I uh, ask people to think about. Say, if, we are, if, if writing to this array is very expensive and we want to do as, li as few writes to this array as possible, then what, what can we do here? And remember one of the questions that, that was on this, on this slide. It said, what goes on the right side of the array? So when we had an array that looks like 1, 0, 3, an acceptable solution to this problem would be to do 1, 3, 3. Because we moved all the non-zeros to the left, and we don't actually put a 0 at the end. We don't actually swap. So in theory, you don't need the swapping. You can just do a sub a equals a sub b. And you can get rid of all these, or not the, yeah, this one. In this case, you would have to decrement b, because b will be pointing to a, a, a non-zero still. So that could be a bug. But this would spare. So if we say, like, writing, we know we're writing over the network. Writing are very expensive. We want to minimize writing. Then this, could be, this would be the optimization. And the reason I put this caveat is because most of the time, people solve this problem where they say, you know, I'll just move through, through the array from both, both pointers will be on the left side. And whenever I find, there will be like a slow and a fast pointer. And whenever I find a zero, um, I move the fast pointer. Whenever I find a non-zero, I move the, the slow pointer. So basically, they will have like an I and a J. And they move, so there's a non-zero here. So they move both of them. So I and J become here. And then they find a zero, so they keep J here. They move I. And then now they find a non-zero, so they switch 3 and 0. So this becomes 3. This becomes 0. And j stays here. And, and then they do this. So they're just basically moving through the array from the left to the right. And the reason there's a problem with this is if the array looks like this, like imagine there's like 50 million zeros, and there's a 1 at the end. The solution that goes from the left to the right will have to swap every 0. But the, but the, well, not, not in this one. The, the one the, the, so this one I described does this. But there are, there are times where people just rewrite every element. So they write the 1, they rewrite the 3, and they rewrite the. So if you do it that way, you would have to rewrite every element in the array. And in this case, you're, you're rewriting all these zeros that are unnecessary. The one that, what was his name? The guy? The one he solved actually just does one write operation, which is moving the one here, and, and that's it, just simply one, one right operation. So anyways, there, this is another problem where you can solve it like three or four different ways. Each one of them has some advantages or disadvantages, and they follow certain constraints or not. So now we've been here for almost two hours or an hour and a half. So I want to I wanna stop talking and give you guys a chance to, if you want to just ask questions. I can keep going and giving you more and more problems, but I know that we also got to leave here soon. So. Let's, let's stop here and, and just take some questions or any discussions that you guys have, and we can wrap up afterwards. Yes? I have a not, not a related question, but how do you combine work with travel? Where you work, how do you work? Yeah, I, 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 